Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the first webinar of the oil spill modeling webinar series. Today's topic is integrated oil spill and transport modeling. My name is Chrissy Liskey. I'm the ocean planner for Delaware Coastal Programs and will be moderating today's session. Just some things to note, we are recording today's session and we'll send you a link to the recording when it's available. Everyone will be muted throughout the webinar and there is no raise hand feature, but you are encouraged to ask questions at any time by entering them into the questions box of your control panel and they will be answered at the end. I would now like to, um, I would now like to welcome Avalon Bristow, who is the program director of the Mid-Atlantic Regional Council on the Ocean, where she oversees much of Marco's regional collaborative efforts and work group activities. Avalon, thank you so much for coming and giving some opening remarks. Thanks so much, Christy, and good morning, everyone. On behalf of the Mid-Atlantic Regional Council on the Ocean, also known as MARCO, I'd also like to welcome you to the first webinar in our oil spill modeling webinar series, Integrated Oil Spill and Transport Modeling. MARCO is the Regional Ocean Partnership for the Mid-Atlantic. It was established in 2009 by the governors of New York, New Jersey, Delaware, Maryland, and Virginia. MARCO is an interstate collaboration that addresses shared regional priorities and provides a collective voice on important ocean issues that transcend political and geographic borders. Please visit our website, www.midatlanticocean.org, to view any of our previous webinars and to learn more about Marco's work. Today's event was planned in partnership with the Delaware Department of Natural Resources and Environmental Control, also known as DENREC, to share results of the effort to model possible oil spill scenarios off the Delaware coast. Although the results are Delaware specific, DENREC and MARCO are hopeful that the results and processes used in the analysis can be used to support other states in the Mid-Atlantic to conduct their own analyses. I am so pleased to welcome our speaker today, Jill Rowe, and I thank her for joining today to present her work to model oil fate and transport to Delaware under different offshore spill scenarios. Finally, I'd like to thank you all in attendance today for joining us. I hope you're as excited as I am to learn more about the potential impacts from hypothetical spill scenarios located offshore of the Mid-Atlantic, and hope you will join us for the second and final webinar in our series illustrating the results, uh, the resulting economic impacts from the modeled oil spills next Thursday. I'm going to pass the mic back to Christy Liskey, who will introduce our first presenter. Thank you so much. Thanks, Avalon. And now I'd like to welcome Carrie St. Laurent. She manages the Applied Science section of the Delaware Coastal Programs and is going to give a little background on our, um, on our presentation today. Okay. Well, thank you. Thank you so much, Christy. Um, and so, as Christy said, my name is Carrie St. Laurent. I manage the Applied Science section of uh, the Delaware Coastal Programs within DENREC. Uh, the Coastal Zone Enhancement Program, also known as Section 309, encourages state coastal management programs, such as the Delaware Coastal Management Program, to strengthen and improve their program in one or more of the nine identified enhancement areas. This includes coastal hazards, such as oil spills. In 2019, the Delaware Coastal Management Program applied for and received a Project of Special Merit, a competitive funding program from NOAA available to the Coastal Management Programs, which includes Section 309 in their program. Our goal of this project was to help fill a knowledge gap on what the economic impacts would be to Delaware in the event of an offshore oil spill. This project has three goals. The first, to better understand the fate and transport of different offshore oil spill scenarios, the second to estimate the economic impacts of these modeled oil spills to Delaware, and then the third to increase the data and information available to help build resiliency in Delaware's coastal communities. Today's webinar will focus on that first goal, modeling the fate and transport of different offshore oil spill scenarios, and please return next week for the second, which will look at the economic impacts to Delaware. Thank you very much, Christy, and I look forward to the talk from Jill. Thanks, Carrie. Um, now I'd like to introduce Jill Rowe. She is the Director and Offshore Wind Lead for the Ocean Science Sector of RPS in South Kingston, Rhode Island. 
She is responsible for coordinating environmental assessment projects company-wide. In that role, she works with individual project manager, managers and technical staff to ensure that all projects are completed successfully and on time. She has 20 years of experience specializing in biological and environmental data gathering, analysis and management, natural resource damage assessments, modeling and analysis of pollutant fates and effects, ecological risk assessment, impact assessment of dredging and development projects, preparing sections of environmental impact statements, providing NEPA support, environmental sensitivity analysis, and GIS mapping and analysis. Jill has managed and assisted on projects having large teams consisting of both academic expert and consultant subcontractors, such as facilitating and leading technical working groups and expert committees for both the Deepwater Horizon Natural Resource Damage Assessment and the Bureau of Safety and Environmental Enforcement Relative Environmental Sensitivity Analysis. Thank you so much for being here, Jill. I'm really looking forward to your presentation and learning more about the oil spill models. Thank you very much. Nice to be here as well, Christy. I believe I will begin to share my screen. There we go. Okay. Thank you so much, everyone. Um, good to see you all today, and thank you for joining on this uh, interesting topic for today. So I will be talking about the Delaware um, DENREC oil spill modeling and impact assessment. Um, so I'll just get straight to it. So this was a conjoined effort between RPS and industrial economics. So next week you'll be talking, I'm hearing from Jason Price from industrial economics on the economic impact. But as we discussed today, we'll just be talking about the oil spill modeling and the assessment of S effects from those different scenarios. This is just a list of the quick or, uh, contributors that we had for this analysis from the RPS side. So just in general, as a little bit of an overview of what we'll be discussing today, I'll give you a very brief overview on RPS, who we even are, um, a little overview of the study itself and the area, um, and then kind of go right into the model scenarios the approach that we used, um, some of the representative scenarios that we're using and discussing today, as well as the inputs, the outputs, and the results. And the purpose of all of this, again, was to feed into the economic analysis that in industrial economics was doing as well, which you'll hear about next week. I am personally in the Rhode Island office, so um, 50 folks within the Rhode Island office. Um, and we've been doing a number of oil spill modeling, et cetera, for many years. So in general, as an introduction to this study, as I mentioned, we were examining the trajectory and fate of these different oils, or actually just one type of an oil, um, for hypothetical spills along the mid-Atlantic. And again, the main purpose of this was to look at the potential risks um, to the state of Delaware itself. But we did model 12 hypothetic, and I'll explain what stochastic means later, but stochastic model scenarios um, off of Delaware, New Jersey, and Virginia, again, looking to see what the impacts were potentially to the Delaware. And these different stochastic scenarios um, look at a potential range of environmental conditions. We looked at different oil volumes, low, medium, and high volumes. Um, and we did surface spills and one blowout location um, for offshore locations per region. Then we did after stochastic modeling, which again, I'll explain more what that means. We picked individual representative scenarios. So that means we picked just one date um, and assessed what they actually would happen if the spill occurred on that date. Um, and that was based on the worst case from the stochastic, which is a large number of scenarios, based on what that one day would have been that created the most um, shoreline oil, shoreline oiled. Um, above a certain threshold. So I'll explain more about what that means. And we did this over looking at each season, winter, spring, summer, and fall, and also um, over the whole annual um, area. And then we also did some for these representative scenarios with and without response. So we wanted to see what that would do if you did nothing, and then also if you've added some of these response mechanisms. And we only did that to the high volume scenarios. And as I mentioned, we'll be discussing this further Next week, IAC will be talking about how our results then went into their socioeconomic um, discussion. So in general, for the, the modeling approach, we used our SIMAP model, which has been um, redeveloped way back in 1990 as part of the Oil Pollution Act. But basically what that is, is comes in two different types of phases. 
Um, we have the oil map deep, which is more only for the blowout scenarios. So that's just assessing what the actual plume dynamics would be and the dropping sizes to come from the blowout. We're not talking about that today because we're only talking about the surface scenarios, but once the um, oil does reach the surface, then that's what we called our far field model. So it's a trajectory and fate model um, looking at the potential of the released oil over time and space. It's a Lagrangian element model. And then we have lots of documentation and publications on the model. So at future time, if you want more information, you can reach out to me specifically. And we also have a lot of this in our full technical report, um, which I know is publicly available. <clears throat> so as I mentioned, there's two different types of the modeling. So what we first called was our stochastic modeling. So what this is, is looking at um, multiple different runs all at once. So we basically model like 400 individual scenarios. So a scenario is at a specific release date and time um, from a specific location. We track the volume, we track all of that. But basically what the stochastic modeling approach does is that you're looking at a long-term wind and currents record. So I'll explain what we did for those as well. Um, but you're sampling from a whole bunch of different um, types of environmental conditions. So over five to 10 years, this can include storms, this can include regular average information as well. Um, and then over those 10 years, we randomly select start dates. So that's what the stochastic modeling approach is. And so this is just a view of each one of these as an individual trajectory, so one individual day, <clears throat> and then they layer on top of each other. And then that's what gives us these stochastic modeling um, figures. <clears throat> Again, we're not talking too much about stochastic today. We're talking more about the representative cases. But basically what this is is a statistical analysis. So when you do look at the stochastic modeling figures, don't get scared that that is one particular spill. That's supposed to be a probabilistic view of what it would be over the course of all these different scenarios. Um, and so it's a statistical analysis where, again, I'm looking at the overall probability and the minimum time of like these 100 different spills, when would they potentially reach the shore? Then what the next phase is, and I'll talk about that, then we selected representative trajectories from these different stochastic scenarios, and I'll explain. Um, basically, we pick from there with the 100 different scenarios, we would look to see with a particular location what was the worst case to having the um, longest length of shoreline oiled. So that then would be a one particular day. And then that's looking at the environmental conditions of that one particular day. And that's our representative scenario. So we did a number of those. And was, I'll show you the scenario matrix next, but 60 different you know, scenarios looking at randomized days. You can get more detail about those specifically. So that's how that works. So it's stochastic, and then what I call, I often call it as deterministic modeling, and that's basically just representative of one particular day. So one of these trajectories we kind of analyzed in more detail. This is just an overview of the SIMAP oil processes um, that our model tracks. Again, we have a lot more technical detail that you can get from some of our published papers that I'm happy to provide if anybody has questions. Um, and then also um, we provide some information as well in the technical report um, that you can download from the DENREC um, website. But in general, we're tracking all these different phases, phases both in the surface as well as subsurface. So there's a number of different pieces. And so obviously it's always developed and determinant on the winds, the currents, um, that aspect as well, as well as evaporation. So we do track it to the surface and on above. And then, as I mentioned in our deterministic cases or our representative cases, we also looked at applying um, some response. So I'll explain exactly how we did that as well. But we can look at mechanical cleanup, dispersion, in situ burning, et cetera. So this is just to show you all the different processes that our model um, tracks. <clears throat> and then in terms of the portrayal of our, offshore, of our results into the different maps that you will see, um, in general, we're looking at the different types of appearance of oil. So um, ultimately, this is just a table that we, we rely on and we go by is NOAA in 2016, um, and also the Bonn Agreement of Oil Appearance Code. So we're looking here at what these different types of, you'll see in the results when I do show the figures, um, that we have different, thing, different cutoffs for the microns. So it'll be silver sheen all the way to heavy fuel oil. 
Um, so we call this like it's 0.1 micron. And then you'll also see in our um, figures that we also refer to that as grams per meter squared. So that's just the same thing we can make us pretty much equivalent that all of our um, output is gridded. So basically a gram per meter squared. So one micron is about one gram per meter squared um, averaged over the course of the grid. But so this is just kind of helpful, um, a helpful table to show exactly kind of where these different um, machines and what the different descriptions are. And then again, how we um, portray that in our modeling results. As a follow on this um, visual observations of the surface oil. So this is kind of also helpful just to have pictures of what we would call these different microns um, and these different thicknesses to be. So a silver sheen again, so that's kind of in this like area in here. Um, and then some of this is silver here as well. So that's the, the lowest thickness, so that's 0.01 micron. Um, and then the rainbow sheen, so that kind of pokes more into this area here, that's about one micron, 0.1 micron or 0.1 gram per meter squared. And then the metallic sheen, which that kind of shows here, um, is uh, one to 10 micron. So that's just a helpful thing to try to get a feel for <clears throat> where we are with this, the light refined and then the heavy. So we did not model, I'll explain that in a minute, but we did not model heavy fuel oil so that we wouldn't be seeing that in the kind of scenarios that we were working on. Um, the light is a bit, a bit more what we were referring to here. So in general, um, as we mentioned, this is a model. So models also require, um, you know, making sure that your inputs are as uh, realistic as possible. <clears throat> so I'll go over where we actually did our modeling, um, the fuel type that we used, different types of volumes that we used, our geographic information. So where we've got our shoreline and our bathymetry, and then also um, environmental conditions. So obviously the forcing behind the winds and currents are important um, in terms of how we did our modeling. So in terms of the location of the spills, um, again, today we're just going to be focusing on the Delaware surface spill locations and actually we're only looking at five of those representative scenarios that we worked on. Um, but our overall report has all of this, <laughs> so it's nice. It's a nice um, big report <laughs> that you can go through and see all the different results for all the different locations. But for the surface spill, we were looking at um, this is a known lightering area. So we picked um, working with Denrac, we picked kind of what the most representative spill locations could be. Um, and so this Denrac, uh, I mean the the lightering location was kind of a in between there and then some of the other areas like we would look at traffic lanes, et cetera. So we were picking what was the most representative of a potential surface spill. So again, that would be like a collision, a lesion, or just an actual spill of a, of a vessel that was transiting. And then again, today we're not talking about the, um, the subsurface spills, but these out here were what we used for our subsurface analysis. Um, and those are expected well locations, so that's what we use for those. So again, today we're just focusing on the surface fill location for um, Delaware. And then for the oil type, <clears throat> so we ended up using a representative light crude oil um, as kind of a representative of the majority of what's being shipped in that area, especially for um, in those lightering locations, so that could be also be a spill at the lightering location itself. Um, it's a, you know, the light sweet, um, low sulfur and condensates are really important in this region of the mid-Atlantic, so we use that as also representative. So we selected a light crude oil with an API um, or density of 37, so again that was pretty representative. And what we ended up using for this was the MC252 um, oil that we've been very well characterized from the Deepwater Horizon oil spill, so we worked on that for NOAA. Um, for years and years and helped with the analysis of the transport and fate of the Deepwater Horizon oil spill. So the characterization we have of the MC252 has been very well validated even against um, actual field observations, so we're very comfortable with that um, oil type that we used. In terms of the selection of the release volume, so as I mentioned, we did a low, medium, and high volume on um, different releases. Um, and again, this is for the surface fills. And then of course we did the blowout rate as well, which I'm not focusing on today. But for the, um, for the surface fills, we looked at a low volume 
and we assessed that at 126 barrels, and that was based on BOEM. So BOEM has done a, quite a bit of research on the medium size of um, the low volume, so about between 50 and, nine, and about 1,000. Um, the medium volume, so again, that was uh, based on BOEM's reported medium size, which was greater than 1,000 barrels. And then for the high volume worst case discharge, um, we were doing that based on the Coast Guard's maximum um, most probable discharge planning volume calculation for very large crew carriers that would be lightering off of Delaware. So that assumes about 10% of the cargo capacity would be released. So, and again, today we're just focusing on more of the surface spills um, <clears throat> that we modeled. So again, for that first phase of the project was to look at the stochastic. So those are more the probabilistic, looking at the, the hundreds of spills um, for a particular region. So um, this is just showing you that we did do 12 different scenarios, stochastic scenarios um, for offshore Delaware, offshore New Jersey, and offshore Virginia. Um, again, today I'm just focusing on the offshore Delaware, only the surface releases, but we did look at the different volumes, low, medium, high, we assumed um, kind of the, again, these are spills at the lightering locations, so assume that the discharge would occur about within an hour. Um, and then we tracked that model duration and model spill for 30 days. So that's the typical that we've been working with Bessie and Bohm um, at, is about to track that for 30 days. And so again, this is for the offshore lighting location off of Delaware. And again, we modeled these other locations as well, um, which we described more in our report. Um, and again, the premise of that being that, um, how does that affect the impacts in Delaware? So again, what we call this the deterministic. So these are when we selected those one representative cases based on the one that had the length of the most um, oil uh, shoreline. So again, uh, focusing on Delaware alone. So we did 20 different deterministic or one-off um, scenarios. For Delaware, we did 20 for New Jersey and 20 for Virginia. But again, today I'm just focusing on Delaware. And we looked at, again, winter, spring, summer, and fall. And then we did unmitigated. So that means no response um, being added in low, medium. But then in the high, we did um, unmitigated. And then we also did mitigated. So um, I'll explain a bit what those different uh, response measures were, but that's how we um, did that. We just did it for the 200,000 um, barrel scenarios with the mitigation. And then again, we did the well blowout as well, um, not being discussed still today, but definitely provided um, within the uh, technical report. So again, today I'm only focusing on five representatives. We kind of took that huge matrix and just boiled it down to some representative scenarios to even discuss within an hour here today. Um, and we also have a small summary document that pulls out, it's about a five page document that also accompanies this presentation um, that you can refer to as well for this. So again, we just looked at um, the high volume mitigated and unmitigated, oops, mitigated and unmitigated, as well as low volume, um, as well as a winter case, just to show you kind of a difference between the summer and a winter, and then also the median case as well. So in terms of environmental conditions, as I mentioned, um, these are important that we have these as the good forcing factors for our scenarios. So um, the retention of the oil in terms of like how long does it stay on the shoreline, et cetera, depends on the shore type, the oil properties, et cetera. Um, so what we do here is we actually have what we call habitat grids. So we use um, environmental sensitivity analysis data from NOAA to map out the different types of shore types. So um, gravel beach versus rocky beach versus intertidal. And NOAA is continuously updating that. So we use the most up-to-date that we had at the time of the study. Um, and then again, different shore types have different types of retention. Um, Sandy Beach has a different retention than a gravel and a rocky. Um, and then bathymetry, as I mentioned, this is also important, um, primarily important for the well blowout scenarios, um, but also good to have, obviously, for the surface scenarios as well. And we use GEPCO for our source of the bathymetry. And then for winds and currents, we used ROMs for the um, winds and currents, and then the NSEP NAM scenario or modeled currents as well. So that just provides you here a, an overview of what the um, regional uh, 
coverage is of both those different types of currents and winds. And then for temperature, we use the World Ocean Atlas 18 temperature and salinity. So that also kind of helps to affect what the conditions are of your scenarios. And we use all these for every single one of our scenarios. So the same um, environmental conditions for all scenarios. For the mitigation options, as I mentioned, this was only for the high volume 200,000 barrel scenarios, um, surface scenarios. So we looked at surface dispersion and oops, we only did, um, we did no restriction on the volume of the dispersants that were available. Um, we did not apply uh, dispersants within a five nautical mile exclusion zone of the release site. We also did not provide, put those in waters less than 10 meters or within three nautical miles of the shoreline. For the dispersants, there's a dispersion oil ratio, so we assumed 1 to 20, and that that was only occurring during daylight hours beginning on day two. And then they were only effective on oil thicker than 8 microns um, and with viscosity of greater than 20,000 centipoise. We also, for these scenarios, did mechanical removal and in situ burning. And so for the mechanical removal, um, we did that based on what we had seen as an effective and actually a, a more realistic um, effective removal rate from Deepwater Horizon. And then we also only did that during daylight hours and also um, within a five nautical mile. We had a not within a five nautical mile exclusion zone of the release site. And when I mentioned here about only doing favorable environmental conditions, basically what we do is we apply a criteria when we know that response could not be applied. So, so for instance, there might be particular wave heights or current speeds when we know that you cannot be um, applying these different uh, factors. So we put that as part of our criteria. But the model knows once it hits that current speed or that wave height that it will not apply the, the response during that time. So in general, for our model outputs, I'll just be showing you again some examples here, um, but there's, and, and I won't be showing too much on the stochastic analyses, but again, that's about 400 individual scenarios that were done throughout the year and over several years to sample the environmental variability. We look at surface and shoreline probability and also the minimum time to reach shore for those unmitigated releases. Um, we also look at frequency distributions of the shoreline and the surface oiling. So over the 100 to 400 different scenarios, how what's the frequency um, of those different things occurring? And then, as I mentioned, then we do deterministic. So that's the representative worst case based on the maximum length of shoreline from those different 100 to 400 different scenarios for a particular location. And then for those representative or deterministic cases, we look at time series information, so mass balance on, you'll see some examples of that here, surface oil concentrations, shoreline concentrations, and in-water concentrations. So once we can pick a particular representative day, we can dig down more into the details of what would happen on a particular um, case where the length of shoreline is at its maximum oiling. So as an example of some of the um, modeling outputs. There's the stochastic. These are what I was talking about, these surface oil probability um, figures. Again, so this is 400 to 100 to 400 different scenarios layered on top of each other. So this would not be the representative of one particular case. This is a high volume case with the one hour release and tracking the oil over 30 days. And again, here's your probability. And again, these are the thresholds that I was talking about. So that's the minimum threshold of 0.01 microns. So um, you can kind of have your maps look different ways based on the threshold of, of exceeding. So this is just that's that lower threshold. And then again, we looked at minimum time of the, um, the number of days that the surface oil would exceed that threshold. So here that's kind of showing you within a day um, that's only within here, but then as you start getting out 30 days or so, then it's a different um, representation. And then this is the idea of the frequency distribution. So this is looking at all the different 100 scenarios and what they would do in terms of the sur surface area. So 50 percentile is at about this level, while 90 percentile is at about 25,000 um, kilometers squared above again that threshold at any instant in time. So this was not in a particular geographic location, but any time over that still. And then these are just examples of the deterministic scenario. So now we had done the stochastic, we pick one particular case out of that based on whichever one had the most maximum um, length of shoreline oiled above the threshold. 
And so now this is just that one particular place. And this is looking at floating oil on the water surface, again, grams per meter squared, which is also equivalent to one micron. Um, and again, it's just showing you the how much of that was occurring over the course of those, um, that's over the course of the whole 30 days. So that's like a surface area swept figure. And then again, here we're looking now just at shorelines, um, again, looking at the different range of the shoreline oiling um, for that one particular spill. So this little crosshair here is the spill site location. And then, and then this is the one example for the 20, 200,000 barrel unmitigated surface case in summer. And then this is also um, the total hydrocarbons on the shoreline as well. And then we actually have the, um, the PAH just, just concentration throughout. So this is in the water column itself. So this is just showing a cross section and a little zoom in area of the PAH concentration vertically within the water column. And then this is an example of a mass balance graph. So this is just showing you over the course of the 30 days, what the um, oil, what was happening within the register of the oils. So for instance, um, you can see surface versus atmosphere versus water columns, sediment, ashore, and degraded. So we have a number of these throughout, and this is looking at the volume of the oil over time, um, what was the fate of the oil. So this is just an example of one of the high volume unmitigated cases in the summer. So again, this is floating oil. I'm just kind of focusing in a bit more on what I just showed you at the different types of um, um, output that we have. So again, this is floating oil on the water surface, grams per meter squared, so equivalent to one micron. And then again, here's the total hydrocarbons on the shoreline. So like how, what's the actual concentration of the total hydrocarbons on the shoreline for that particular scenario. And then also, again, the maximum pH concentration vertically. So within the water column, um, what was the, the overall pH concentration um, over time? And that's over all time. So again, these are kind of cumulative approach um, of the output. And then here's uh, the mitigated version. So now we actually now have applied um, the uh, mechanical removal, surface dispersants, and in situ burning. So now the footprint has um, reduced slightly because of that. And then here again, so now we're on the shoreline. So obviously the big thing you're going to see throughout here is that when we do add that um, mitigation, it obviously reduces the amount onto the shoreline because now the fate of the oil is um, not as much on the surface and so not reaching the shore. Oops. And then here is the pH concentration vertically um, for that mitigated case. So this is just a good example of the unmitigated versus the mitigated. Again, just the summer season, just the high volume, because that's the only ones we did the mitigation for. So you just see a reduction in the footprint of the floating oil on the surface. So here's an example of the comparison of the mass balance graphs between the unmitigated and the mitigated. So again, what you're seeing here is that um, overall, this is at the end of the 30-day simulation, and overall the mass balance did not differ greatly between scenarios since we were using the same oil type for all scenarios. Um, there was definitely differing in the volume, but not so much into the, the, the pattern that we saw. So in most cases, about half of the released oil evaporated into the atmosphere within the first five days. So you can see that here in this black line right here. So um, based on the surface release and the type of oil it was, um, for the most part, about half of it um, does evaporate within the first five days. Um, and then obviously the big thing to note here is that with mitigation percent um, ashore, so that is the purple line here, um, decrease, decreases drastically um, with the uh, addition of mitigation. And then uh, also the other important thing to note here is that regardless of specifically with, um, with mitigation, but also in general, so with the surface, especially with mitigation, less than 1% of the oil remained on the, remained on the surface at the end of the simulation. So now it's not on the surface, it's not on the shoreline. It is um, more typically within the water column because now that's what's doing with some of these dispersions, et cetera. They're changing the fate of the oil. 
So this is another example. This is now the low volume. So this is the 126 barrel unmitigated surface coat uh, case in the summer. So this is just a good example of a comparison of what the footprint looks like. You'll see that the floating oil on the water surface is much, so now we're kind of in the rainbow sheen side is much lower. And then this is just an example of what it is, the total hydrocarbons on the shoreline, as well as a pH concentration. So you can see with this one, there is no pH over the course of, um, of, of uh, the very little, maybe right near the spill site itself. So again, this is the mass balance graph for the low volume. So again, you can see it's kind of a similar pattern. Again, um, you know, the, most of it, half of it goes to the atmosphere and then the first five days. So it does look somewhat similar. Obviously, the volumes are smaller, but um, in general, the trend is the same. So this is an example of the winter. So obviously, now you can see the wind has changed in this case. So now it's heading more to the southwest. Um, but this also just shows you kind of, again, what the unmitigated case is for the high volume. We did do mitigation on this as well. Um, and again, this is the short type. So now we're starting because it's a Delaware spill, but then obviously the wind changed in this particular scenario. So now we're doing hitting more of Virginia into the, um, into the shorelines that are oiled. And then here again is your pH concentration over time. And then here is the median spill. So now we're at the 2,240 um, barrel spill. So again, this is like we're looking at again all these same scenarios are off a lightering location off of Delaware. Um, and this is an example in the summer season. Again, so the shore type or the shore line, and then also the pH um, concentrations within the water column. And again, very similar-ish trends um, in terms of what the pattern looks like um, with most of it going um, evaporating within a short period, five days or so. And then this again is without mitigation. So this is just um, what that would look like for that particular scenario. So in general, um, most of this, this is an example, this is just a summary table. We have a number of these different types of summary tables throughout the report. Um, but so it gives you what the mass balance of the oil is at the end of simulation for, again, those worst case scenarios of maximum um, oil length, uh, the maximum length of shoreline oil. But this just, again, kind of shows you, um, you know, what the fate of the oil is over time, looking at percent of oil by the end of the simulation. So for biodegradation, most of it um, occurred as oil is entrained into the water, um, and that makes that be more bioavailable to microbes. So um, in general, the oil in the water would degrade due to um, bio, bioavailability to the microbes. And then on the shore, um, the oil residuals on the shore that did not evaporate would be cleaned, likely, or remain on the shore until it degrades. But this is kind of an important um, face here is, again, to see, for instance, the big thing here is the high volume unmitigated to mitigated. Obviously, you now we have a much lower um, version on the shoreline oiling. And then obviously you can see that some of it has increased within the water as well, because now we're um, putting some more into the water column with the dispersants, et cetera. And then for the shoreline output, again, this is looking at shoreline lengths greater than um, one gram per meter squared or one micron on average over the grid cell. Again, for these representative five cases that we were just picking out, and we looked at it as all, there's different thresholds by this as well. So in our report, we talked more about this as well, about what some of these thresholds are. Some of them are biological, some of them are socioeconomic. So we do have a nice layout of exactly why we chose these thresholds. Um, but here again, this is definitely showing that, um, you know, the mitigation obviously helps with the um, amount of oil on the shore. Um, and you can even see that the high volume, at least for this one particular scenario, um, these are different days, but it still is showing that it even had less than even the low volume. And then again, for the water column output, um, so your exposures to dissolved concentrations, um, this is looking at volumes where fish eggs and larvae and other plankton may be adversely um, affected. So the thing to note on this, um, that this is looking at 
The duration of exposure is in any location. So the big thing to note here is that obviously plankton move throughout the water column, so they're not being continuously exposed, but this is kind of just helpful um, to look at both the volume, the volume contaminated as well as the exposure duration. Um, so you can see here in the low volume, for instance, um, looking at all throughout the whole entire um, grid area, what the maximum number of hours with exposure greater than one part per billion or 10 part per billions. Again, we have explained explanation in our report as to why we chose those different thresholds. Um, but you can see it could be as short as four hours, for the medium is 46 hours. Obviously for the larger spills, it's longer, but there again, that's looking at um, any point in duration. So it's not um, geographically connected. So, in general, again, we only looked at these five scenarios for today, um, but we do have a lot of this described and organized and, and pre presented in the full technical report. Um, and then this information, like I said, was then um, carried into IEC's analysis, what they're going to be talking about, Chris or Jason will be talking about next week, um, to look at the socioeconomic impacts of this. But in general, in terms of the oil spill modeling, the key conclusions are, um, by only using one representative oil type, which was that light crude, uh, which was a very well characterized oil, um, the biggest thing that was influencing the results were the release volume and the response measures, so whether or not we did or did not include um, response. And then the light oil um, that was used has a relatively low viscosity when it's fresh, so this leads to more evaporation, which is what we saw that about 50% of the oil um, had evaporated within the first five days, but we believe that to be realistic based on the type of oil that would be um, used in these lightering locations. Um, and they also have less surface and shoreline oiling. Now that would be compared to a heavy crude, but again, we did an analysis of what was the most, the majority of the oil type that would be used um, in that area. And then the low and medium volume releases in general had very similar, um, had, had the, the the surface footprints remained in the near shore, wa near shore waters off the Delaware coast. Um, and then for the surface oil exposure concentration greater than 100 grams per meter squared, that typically remained in the immediate vicinity of the spill site and didn't um, reach out as far, it didn't have to spread as long as far. Um, and then in terms of the length of shoreline contaminated with oil, that obviously increased increasing volume, so that, that kind of makes sense because obviously you have more um, oil to be dispersed over the water column and throughout the surface. And then the highest concentration of surface oil for the mitigated and unmitigated um, scenarios, again, we only did that for the high volume scenarios. They followed pretty similar trajectories, um, but then differences did exist in the size of the surface and shoreline footprints. And then the big take home here is that um, response as soon as you can get out there. That's what's good about some of this with the um, looking at the minimum time to reaching a threshold. Um, this is good for response um, planning as well. And so obviously your length of shoreline contaminated in the mitigated scenarios obviously dropped considerably compared to the unmitigated scenarios. So um, that's some of the key conclusions there. And then um, my last part is just that I have, if you have any questions, again, we didn't get in too far into the technical details here of the um, model itself, so you can reach out to me with any kind of questions for that. And again, more information is provided in the full technical report. Thank you so much, Jill. That was fascinating. Thank <laughs> you. Um, so I'm going to give everyone a few minutes few seconds to enter questions if you have any into the question box. Um, but I do have a couple questions that we can get started on if you're ready, Jill. Sure. Awesome. So our first question is, it looks like summer was off in the worst case. Was that true throughout and is it because of the winds or most common seasonal weather patterns? Yes, I think that would be the case. It's a lot to do with the winds. Um, it could have to do with the temperature and the seasonality as well. So, um, so that that's a case in point as well. But yes, as you as you saw for that winter scenario, that one representative one that I provided, um, it's happened to head farther south, um, southwest. So yes, it does kind of 
depend on the um, looking at the, the seasonal component of the winds and the currents. Uh, the next question is, how do you think climate change will affect these? I.e., will warming waters or changing storms impact the oil fate and transport? Yeah, so it, it could definitely because temperature and salinity and those changes are important factors into how the oil behaves. Um, so, you know, if the waters get colder, um, things tend to stick around longer on the surface rather than evaporating. So, yes, I mean, I think in general, if current patterns or, um, you know, that, that aspect to it, it definitely does affect it. So, um, so yeah, I mean, I think in general, you'd have to kind of reassess if the currents change. Um, and again, whether the temperature and salinity, again, we use kind of the World Ocean Atlas uh, as our input for the temperature and salinity, but it does affect how the oil behaves um, on that respect as well, because the temperature and salinity are, are you know, how it, whether it's going to emulsify or stay further into the water column, et cetera. So I think over time, we'll just have to kind of reassess exactly how that's going to happen. Thank you. And another question that came in was, is there any significant seasonal differences between spring and fall? Hmm, that's a very good question. And I'd have to go back and see exactly how that was all um, defined into the report itself. If I remember correctly, I do not think that there were significant differences within the seasons. Um, as much, uh, like I said, maybe summer to winter was kind of a bit more um, specific because maybe the wind direction changed. But I don't believe that there was much of a drastically difference between spring and fall. And we also looked at it annually as well. So we looked at the whole entire year and then we also split out the individual seasons as well. Okay, so One that is that, in the report though? Yeah, that is in the report. Okay. Yep. And I was going to say too, it probably might have more of an effect and I'll let Jason talk more about that next week but maybe like in terms of the you know biological organisms are there or the socioeconomic organisms the beach use the, all of that right but in terms of the actual fate of the oil um, I guess we'd have to just confirm exactly how that did with the patterns but I think in general um, there weren't drastic changes uh, when we looked at all the different seasons of what the fate of the oil would do itself. Uh, another question is, how quickly can a model run be conducted? So if a spill mm -hmm. occurred, for example, could the model be deployed quickly to help responders? Yes, that's a very, very good question. So yes, the answer is yes, um, especially in response. So we do do response modeling. And as long as you have the currents and the winds and, uh, you know, we have large libraries of the hydrodynamic or of the um, grids for the habitats, et cetera. If you have all that information, um, yes, it's it's relatively quick. I mean, we do do 24-7 um, modeling right now too to help with that first response, um, making sure that we can get out there and see what the oil is doing. During Deepwater Horizon, for instance, um, we were doing that, just trying to assess like where should the people who are going out there collecting water samples even go. So you are able to do this at a relatively rapid pace. And so we do have a lot of um, Coast Guard and some of the others do use oil map um, as kind of a planning tool, but then also as a response tool to see exactly how fast. So we can do it within, um, you know, hours, basically, assuming that you have all the different components. And so like we said, the Mid-Atlantic, especially if you're forcing you, you did some validation of the currents. And so as long as you have that all set up, you're in very good, very good shape. If you, for some reason, have to do some remote location that you don't have model currents and winds, that could take a little bit longer. But um, for the response that we've been doing, it's, it's, it's pretty um, quick and it's good to help with, with um, determining where to go and how to respond. Thank you. And another question. How did these scenarios compare to other U.S. regions or states that you've worked in? Were there any surprises? No, I'd say not. I mean, I think it's all 
um, dependent on you know exactly where the winds go. So you know maybe because we were relatively close to Delaware um, Bay, that it was you know the water the oil was definitely getting into the shorelines um, further there. Um, but in general, I mean, it, we did some studies um, previously. We did a study for uh, BOEM looking at offshore wind farms and um, looking to see kind of what would a scenario be if like every bit of oil on the wind farm, you know, there's a collapse of a wind farm and what would the um, output look like? And it, it was very similar as well. So, um, so again, it's all based on your current forcing as well. So like it depends on how you're doing that and that oil type that you're using. Um, so there wasn't really any huge surprises. I mean, we would do something similar off the New England area as well. Um, and again, just kind of site specific though, because each area slightly has a little bit different forcing. So you might have like a current that takes it farther offshore rather than another current or the winds might have a bigger direction or bigger play if you're closer to shore. So in general though, not, not a surprise. And it was relatively um, similar-ish to the study that we had done for uh, for BOEM for the offshore wind farms, hypothetical. That was a couple of years ago, 2012. I think. Thanks. Um, next question. What criteria was used for mechanical recovery? Oh, good. So let's go back to that, if you don't mind. Sorry. Easier just to go to that slide. <laughs> okay, here we go. So for the mechanical recovery, again, we were looking at um, the different types of aver average removal rates. So that was based on information that we gleaned and we um, had done from Deepwater Horizon. So there's lots of analysis on that as to how much could be recovered per day. Um, and then again, we did it only during daylight hours. And then I don't have the number specifically off the top of my head, but um, I know it is provided in the report. But we did do a, um, there's a current threshold, so you could only recover within, I'm not gonna say the right number, but there's a specific um, wave and current threshold that we knew at a certain point that you couldn't even do a mechanical removal. So we also added that piece as well. So in general, it was we're using kind of a what we found from the Deepwater Horizon as to like the maximum amount that you could remove, which is 2,166 barrels per day. Um, and then again, only doing it during daylight hours, which was conservative, because in reality, if it was a gigantic spill, um, you could be doing it even longer, like you could potentially try to recover during um, the night times as well. Um, and then for that five nautical mile exclusion zone that I have in there, that's that's for the um, in situ burning. So that's just that there's an exclusion zone for that. So. Great, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, another question: Can this model be used for slow creep leaks? How sensitive is it? Yes, it is. Yep, so it can be, and we do that. Um, for like I said, blowouts. So we can do that for like if a well blowout. Um, that's exactly kind of you know what somewhat deep water horizon, although that that wasn't as slow. But we can model exactly like what the um, release rate is. Uh, so you can do that instead of like I'm like you, I think the person's asking that we just assumed everything would be um, uh, released in an hour. Right, so the slower we do track that, we can even do it in phases. So if we think only like 50% is released in an hour, and then you know it kind of spreads out for the next five hours, we can track that as well. So it is all based on um, there's lots of different scenarios that you could try to uh, do for this, and it would just it would change the fate slightly because obviously then not all the oil is gone in an hour. So then obviously, you know, it's not going to be on the surface that fast and then it's not going to evaporate. So you could just do a, um, kind of a slow, like you say, a slow leak, either through a pipeline, which then if we do it from the pipeline as a subsurface, then that changes the particle size that comes to the surface. So if it's lower, you're going to have, you know, particles coming, but over different types of times versus a complete blowout where it just, you know, all reaches to the surface in a relatively short period of time. So, so yes, release duration is a really important um, feature in terms of determining what the fate of the oil is going to be over time. 
And another question, what response time was used for mechanical recovery mitigation? Mm -hmm. That's a very good question. Um, I have to go back into looking in the details of that. Um, I think it was within 24 hours, but I can't, I'm not going to say that directly. So I think it would have to look back at the report to find out exactly what that is. But um, again, we were trying to be, we've looked at this a lot and uh, again, it is very um, determinate as to, you know, kind of those features also help to determine um, what the actual uh, results will look like as well. Another question, how far inland does the model go? More specifically, does the water domain include inland bays and tidal, tidal tributaries? Yeah, so we did look, um, so this figure kind of shows you a little bit here, but we could get into, it wasn't 100% into like the full, I don't know if you can see it here or not, but we didn't go too far into the tributaries. We did have a whole bunch of discussion with Denrec um, in the beginning. Um, just trying to determine how far did we want to do, you know, get into that. You can, you can resolve this further in future runs if needed. Like if you really wanted to see how far up the tributaries it would go. Um, for this particular case, because we were doing such a large domain as well, it, we didn't get too far into those specific little tributaries, but at least you knew that in some of those results, you know, that it was, was at least reaching the Delaware shorelines. Um, but based on you could resolve that even further you could resolve that further with your hydrodynamics as well um, so for different types of studies uh, you can you can kind of resolve that further but we've done it where we've done full-on you know oil spills especially sometimes this is a hypothetical um, but sometimes we'll do it on hindcast so that means an actual spill that has occurred so for instance for the deep water horizon Spill, we worked with IEC on that as well, and that was a natural resource damage assessment. So obviously we were looking at an actual spill. So when you have that, say there was an actual spill up in the Delaware River, we could track that as far as we can possibly need to based on, you just have to further resolve the hydrodynamics and the shorelines, et cetera, um, for that area. So you can we can go much farther into it. We've done river spills, et cetera, um, based on but it's all based on how far can you resolve the data that you have for the area. Thank you so much, Jill. Um, that's all of our questions. So we finished right on time here. Um, I am just going to share my screen quickly. Um, if anybody has any, any other questions, Jill has offered to uh, take those questions. If you want to follow up with her, her email, we can send out her email and contact information with the um, follow-up email to this webinar. And I wanted to thank you all, Jill and everyone, for joining today. It's a really exciting webinar. Uh, we hope you'll join us for the next one, the economic impacts from an offshore oil spill on thir next Thursday, March 31st at 11 a.m. And again, we will send you an email with a link to the recording as soon as it's available. Thank you all for attending.